Welcome, everyone, uh, to the next uh, TCS Plus seminar, which will be given by Ryan O'Donnell from CMU. It's, uh, again, a pleasure to see so many of you joining us today. Uh, let me remind you, right now, you're all muted, um, but you're all encouraged to unmute yourselves and uh, interrupt Ryan and ask questions throughout the talk. So don't, don't be afraid of uh, interrupting. Everyone will be able to hear you. Just make sure once you're done to please remute yourselves uh, so that we don't have uh, too much background noise. So I wanted to announce a few things uh, before we get started. So uh, first, the upcoming talks. So two weeks from now will be Li Yang uh, Tan from uh, TTIC. And then two weeks after that, we'll have Tim Rothgarden from Stanford. And I want to warn everyone that that talk, so which is one month from now, uh, will take place one hour earlier than usual. So one hour before the time that it's now, wherever you are. Uh, so we're sorry about that. It only happened this one time, uh, but we had no choice. And we uh, all really want to hear Tim. So but please make sure you you know make your room booking changes. All right, a um, ah, couple more announcements. One is that we welcome feedback and suggestions for uh, speakers and talks. So there's a form available on our website, and you can just uh, go there, give your name, give the name of your favorite speaker, your favorite recent result, and we go through these, and uh, this can, you know, decide who's going to talk next in TCS Plus. So please make use of that. Um, and I thought I had one more announcement to make, but um, this uh, is not uh, coming to my mind right now. So let's uh, let's say that was it. So maybe Oded, you want to go through the table and introduce the, the groups. Yes, thank you, Tomar. Uh, no, of course. Yeah. I'm sorry, Oded. I was going to thank everyone for their help. So thanks, Oded, who's doing all the technical work today, and Ninja Day, who's uh, joining us but is having maybe technical trouble. And then behind the scenes, we also have uh, Clement Canon for Colombia and Gotham Kamat from MIT, and Thomas Hollenstein from Zurich doing a lot of uh, work for TCS Plus. So thanks, everyone. All right, Oded. Okay. Uh, it's your time. And let me mention those of us watching through YouTube, the slides are also available uh, on the website. Actually, for everyone, the slides are available on the website. So in case you want to check something um, that wasn't very clear, you can um, download the slides. It's on the um, uh, under the next TCS talk um, tab. So let me go through the um, let me go through um, th uh, through the tables. So we have uh, first we have uh, Akash Kumar from uh, Purdue. Hi, Purdue. Um, we have an India there whose connection seems to be back. Uh, Clement Canon with the group from uh, Colombia. Hi, guys. Uh, we have um, Dawei Wang from uh, Michigan. Hi. Hi, Michigan. We don't see much. Looks very dark. Um, Yob Briet from Amsterdam, from CWI. Hi, guys. Uh, Madur, Madur Tolsiani from uh, TTI Chicago and the University of Chicago. Hi, everyone there. And we have uh, Piyush from uh, Caltech. Hi, Caltech. And Shravas Rao, a few floors above me here at NYU. Hi, guys. And that's it for now. So back to you, Tama. Thanks, Oded. So it's really a great pleasure to have uh, Ryan O'Donnell from CMU uh, give the talk today. Ryan got his PhD 2003, 2003 from MIT with Madhu Sudan. Um, and then he did a couple of postdocs. Uh, uh, sorry, I also don't remember where, but Microsoft and uh, you went to IAS. Where did you go for your first? IAS, IAS. IAS and Microsoft. Yeah, and so since 2006, he's been a professor at uh, at CMU. Um, so Ryan has done tons of work that I'm, again, not going to try to summarize in the uh, harness of complexity in general, harness of approximation, analysis of Boolean functions. Uh, he recently wrote a, a wonderful book that um, everyone uh, on analysis of Boolean functions that uh, everyone has been uh, reading and using. Um, and so Ryan is well known as a very good uh, teacher. Uh, and you can see this from the list of his uh, past students and also expositor uh, of ideas. So it's really exciting to have him uh, give a talk today because I'm pretty sure we're in for a treat. Um, so Ryan is going to tell us uh, about how to refute a random CSP. Um, OK. Thanks very much, Thomas. Thanks, thanks uh, Ryan. and everybody else. It's a pleasure to be giving this talk here at TCS Plus. <coughs> uh, this is joint work with Sarah Allen and David Whitmer, both of whom are uh, here at Carnegie Mellon. 
Okay, so uh, the talk today is on the subject of the average case complexity of constraint satisfaction problems. And uh, a natural example of this, probably the most famous example, is that of random three sets. So I'll tell you about random three set in a few slides. Okay, so in random three set problem, uh, you have n Boolean variables and m constraints, where m is typically a function of n. And each of the constraints is an or of three uniformly random literals. So let literal is a variable or a snogation. And the model is just you pick m random uh, triples, also random negation patterns, take their ors, and that's the random three set instance. Now for this problem, there, uh, things change as you vary m, the number of constraints in a sense. And there's kind of a magic quantity, 4.267 times n, uh, where something interesting happens. Now when m, the number of constraints, is less than this, there aren't too many constraints, it's more likely to be satisfiable, the instance that you choose. And in fact, it's satisfiable with very high probability when m is less than this threshold. And conversely, if m is bigger than this threshold, then uh, there's lots of constraints, it's more likely to be unsatisfiable. And indeed, above this threshold, it's unsatisfiable with very high probability. Actually, this quite hasn't been proven, but the analogous statement for k set for large enough k was recently proven. In any case, it's true. So uh, this is the state of affairs for random three set. So now, depending on whether this uh, number of constraints, m, is uh, smaller or bigger than this threshold, you have um, different natural algorithms problems. So in the satisfiable regime, when m is smaller than the threshold, the natural task is to find a satisfying assignment. Uh, now, when m is uh, bigger than the threshold, here the algorithmic task is a little bit different. You might not have thought about it before. It's to find a refutation. In other words, a proof of unsatisfiability. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about just what this task means. Um, so what is this refutation task? Um, well, one way to think about it is just what it says. The algorithm should output a proof, just that the given formula, the random formula, is unsatisfiable. And, you know, encoded in some formal language like ZFC or what have you. Now, it's, uh, that's maybe a good way to think about it in your head. It might be a little annoying to worry about how do you encode languages and so forth or encode proofs. So another equivalent uh, definition of the task is as follows. Uh, it's a much simpler way to put it. Your algorithm should just look at the random 3CNF formula, the three-set formula, and output either unsatisfiable or no comment. And it should never be wrong. So in particular, if it says unsatisfiable, the formula really has to be unsatisfiable. Now, uh, so far, you could just imagine the algorithm always says no comment, but we don't allow this. In particular, it's only allowed to say no comment with little of one probability. So it should output unsatisfiable with high probability. And this is a fair you know, thing to ask of the algorithm because it's actually true that the random formula is unsatisfiable with very high probability. OK, now you might not have thought of this notion before, but um, there's a, a pretty common algorithmic uh, technique for trying to solve constraint satisfaction problems that fits into this category. Imagine you have a three-sat instance, and you write down some LP relaxation or semi-definite programming relaxation for its value. Um, if that uh, LP or STP value is less than m, the number of constraints, then you can have the algorithm output unsatisfiable, which is certainly true. If even the LP relaxation or the STP relaxation can't satisfy all the constraints, then certainly the, the formula truly is unsatisfiable. And for this kind of technique, what you would hope to show is that for a random three-side instance with a certain number of constraints m bigger than this threshold, that even the LP or STP relaxation value is smaller than m with high probability. So that's the kind of algorithmic task we're going to concern ourselves with in this talk. Uh, I will tell you just briefly a little bit about what's known for the other algorithmic task, finding a satisfying assignment when the number of constraints is smaller than the threshold. Uh, so here there's a smaller quantity, something like 3.5 times n such that it's known if m is less than or equal to even this amount, 3.52 times n, then there is an efficient algorithm that finds satisfying assignment with high probability. Uh, in fact, so in addition, uh, just like a month ago or so, there was a new paper released um, that gives a heuristic algorithm, a polynomial time algorithm with a lot of actual backing for why it should work based on statistical physics, which seems to find satisfying assignments even for a uh, number of constraints m that's all the way up to the threshold 4.267n. So it seems to work in practice. We haven't proved it. But in any case, for the finding a satisfying assignment when m is small uh, problem, it seems like we're kind of in good shape. 
Uh, so let's turn to the topic of today's talk, which is about finding a refutation in the case where the, the formula is unsatisfiable. So here there's also another higher threshold uh, beyond which it's known that you can find refutations efficiently. Um, but this threshold is actually quite large. It's something like n to the 1.5, which is much, much bigger than the threshold at which it becomes truly unsatisfiable. But only is when there's as many as n to the 1.5 uh, constraints do we efficiently know how to sort of certify that a random three-side instance is satisfiable. Uh, so that's what we know. And in fact, this region is a very, very large gap uh, for m in this range where we don't know the algorithmic complexity of the problem. So, you know, given that we don't know anything and we don't have like an efficient algorithm when m is, say, n to the 1.4, you might say, speculate that maybe there is no polynomial time refutation algorithm. That even though these random three set formulas are unsatisfiable with very high probability, there's no efficient algorithm that sort of certifies that or finds proofs. And if that were the case, that would actually be great. That would be really cool because that would be an efficient, you therefore have an efficient way to randomly generate hard to solve algorithmic tasks, and not just any old hard to solve algorithmic tasks, like really simple, hard to, simple looking hard to solve algorithmic tasks. So it'd be a very quick way to generate challenging algorithms problems. And that's good for several reasons. Uh, one potential application, the one that probably occurs to you, is cryptography. And indeed, this has been thought about before starting in works with um, Goldreich, and uh, Benny Applebaum has done a lot of thinking about this topic. So if it were true, or at least believed that um, there are no polynomial time refutation algorithms for this range of M's, uh, it's possible we could start to build cryptographic primitives based on it. Another kind of cool application that I'll mention if we somehow knew that this uh, CSP three-set refutation task was hard is that of hardness of learning. So I won't talk about this too much, but um, it's kind of been a long-standing problem in learning theory to figure out how to show hardness results for in the packed learning model. And uh, some recent works by Daniele, uh, Liniel, Shalev Schwartz uh, have been quite cool. They've shown that if you could assume the hardness of some constraint satisfaction problem refutation tax, then you could get some hardness of learning results for some very classic uh, learning problems, like learning DNFs, learning uh, intersections of half spaces, things like that. OK, for these two problems, uh, it actually turns out to be important to investigate um, random constraint satisfaction pro problems for predicates other than uh, or, other than the three sat predicate. So that's what we're also going to be talking about today, random constraint satisfaction problems where the predicate is uh, not necessarily just or, not necessarily just a KSAT problem. Um, in particular, I'll tell you a little bit about how it connects to the application. So, uh, suppose that you have some predicates P, K area predicates P, and you believe that refuting random instances of the constraint satisfaction problem with predicate P is hard when the number of constraints M is some polynomial like N to the C. Um, for the application one, the cryptography application, it doesn't quite give it to you necessarily. It depends on some details, but let's say it would give evidence that there are highly efficient pseudo-random generators, where highly efficient means in NC0, and in particular, each output of the pseudo-random generator only depends on KC bits, um, that have stretch, good stretch. They stretch N seed bits to N to the C seed bits. Okay, so for this application, um, you don't care too much what the predicate P is. You'd like K to be small, and what you'd really like is C to be as big as you can get it. So you really like the CSP problem to be as hard as possible, even when there are lots of constraints. Uh, for the second application, showing hardness of pack learning, uh, again, you have to put some reduction in here, and it's not immediate, but uh, typically in the Daniele et al. program, you can derive some hardness of learning results for concept classes related to P, uh, assuming that C goes to infinity as K goes to infinity. So here I'm really thinking about hardness for a family of predicates P. And for this application, kind of the reverse um, desiderata is true. You don't care so much about what C is, as long as it sort of goes to infinity as the arity goes to infinity. Uh, but you have to be quite uh, careful about what the predicate P is, because that directly impacts what concept classes you show hardness for. 
Okay, so I hope this modify, motivate the idea of trying to understand the hardness or easiness of uh, refuting random instances of constraint satisfaction problems with different predicates. Uh, any questions to this point? Yeah, I have a small question. Uh, like all the very high probability, is it only over the randomness of the instance or also the algorithm? Meaning like you've got to, to say, uh, say for example, unsatisfiable with very high probability even when the instance has been random but fixed, or it's uh, it's always over the probability of the random instance? Um, usually we allow the algorithm to use both its own internal randomness and over the randomness of the instance. Uh, for the algorithms I'll talk about today, and I think many algorithms, they actually happen to be deterministic. But we also don't mind if they're uh, randomized. And I think for the learning application, part of the learning application, you should allow them to be randomized, the algorithms themselves. OK, thanks. Any other uh, questions? I, yeah, I have a question. So you're going to show that uh, some refutation task is algorithmically possible. Is that, uh, is that correct? Yeah, that's the spoiler. We're actually going to show some algorithms. Uh, and how is that going to give evidence for hardness of PRGs or like? Oh, it won't. It'll be the it'll be the opposite. Okay. So you can imagine it as like um, breaking candidate PRGs, or you know, showing that it's not going to be a good strategy to try to get. Uh, learning hardness this way. Okay. Uh, I'll mention a bit more in connection with the learning hardness in a, in a bit. OK, good questions. Uh, OK, so having motivated the study of random CSPs for predicates other than CASA, I, I just want to mention that um, this problem is heavily studied in the case of random CASA, because random CASA is sort of everybody's favorite random CSP, and quite a bit less studied for other predicates. OK, so this is the main theorem for the talk. Uh, I'll actually spend like you know, 10 minutes at least explaining all the words and so forth in this theorem. So uh, let me start to tell it to you now. So our main theorem is an algorithm. Uh, it's an algorithm for refuting random CSPs. And in particular, it's a polynomial time efficient algorithm that for any uh, fixed predicate P with arity K, it refutes random instances of the CSP with predicate P, provided the number of constraints is large enough. You know, the task always gets easier the more constraints there are. And it starts to work our algorithm as soon as m is bigger than n to the complexity of p over 2. I haven't told you what this complexity of p is yet, but it's some number. I'll get to it in a minute. But the main point is our algorithm is, uh, our main result is an algorithm for refuting instances of random CSPs. OK, so let me go through all the things on this slide a little bit more carefully. Uh, okay, so about this complexity of p, it's um, not too hard to understand uh, integer, depending on p, uh, it's at least 2, and it's always at most k. Uh, so our algorithm always works if m is uh, sort of bigger than n to the k over 2, where k is the arity. But sometimes it works even uh, when m is a lot smaller, in particular when this complexity is a lot smaller. Let me just say for like several or many predicates, this complexity can be even as small as 2 or 3 or 4, so some constant independent of, of k. OK, I'll give you the proper definition later, but that's what I'll say about this complexity parameter for now. Um, at the very end of the talk, I'll even try to tell you about some evidence that this might be the right answer, that this n to the complexity over 2 might be sort of the algorithmic threshold beyond which you can do it and below which you maybe can't do it. Uh, this greater than greater than sign, uh, it hides polylog factors. Uh, I won't really mention this much more in the rest of the talk, but whenever you see that sign, uh, it's ignoring polylog factors. So m has to be, when I say a little bit bigger than n to the complexity over 2, I mean by a polylog factor. Um, OK, so in particular, if you remember the most basic problem we talked about, 3sat, there the predicate p is the or of three variables. And since I told you the complexity of any KRE predicate is at most K, we know the complexity of the 3 ARE OR predicate is at most 3. So this tells us it recovers the result I mentioned up to polylog factors that you can refute random 3 sat once M is basically bigger than N to the 1.5. Actually, I can mention, I'll tell you just right now, the complexity of the OR of 3 predicate is exactly 3. So it's not like we get anything better than N to the 1.5. And actually, in general, um, for the OR predicate on K inputs, the complexity is uh, exactly K. Question. Yep. Uh, for for case, I mean, 
there's also this thing that at N to the 1.4, there exist uh, small certificates of unsatisfiability, though it's not always clear how to find them. Uh, correct. So that's uh, the, the questioner was referring to like a very intriguing um, result by uh, Feige came in effect that shows for 3 sat when M is like N to the 1.4, um, basically you can refute these instances in NP. In other words, there exist short proofs of unsatisfiability. We just don't know how to find them. Uh, so I will talk more about... Also, uh, do you know if this kind of thing happens for other predicates also? Uh, I can s say a little bit more about that. Um, I can actually mention that uh, one of the co-authors here, David Whitmer and Uri Feige, have extended that result to higher KSAT. Um, so they get uh, refutations non-deterministically for a number of constraints that's a little bit less than n to the k over 2. At least David told me they did that. He kind of sketched it to me, but I think they're still writing it up. Uh, that's mostly all I know. Thanks. Uh, that's a good question, though, yeah. Right, so as I said, uh, KSAT is the most heavily studied CSP, and actually we our theorem gives a new result even for this fairly heavily studied case. Um, the complexity of the OR predicate on K inputs is K, as I mentioned. So our reputation algorithm works as soon as M is sort of noticeably bigger than N to the K over 2. And the best thing known previously was N to the ceiling K over 2. So we save about a root N factor on the number of constraints when K is odd. Uh, let's see. Our result also holds equally well for non-Boolean predicates, so over a larger alphabet, but I won't really say anything more about that. Uh, our polynomial time algorithm runs in time like n to the order k, so you should definitely think of k as like really a constant. Um, if you know about this sum of squares, SOS, uh, STP hierarchy business, I can also mention that our algorithm uh, fits into that framework, so our algorithm can just be, you know, do k rounds of this SOS uh, hierarchy. But I also won't say much more than that, except that you'll eventually see that our algorithm sort of works by... Uh, showing that the eigenvalues of some matrix are small. So it's kind of natural that STP techniques should uh, work. Let's see, do I have anything else to say about this? Ah, yes. So this uh, comment here actually provides an important definition for the rest of the talk. So actually our algorithm does something a little bit better than just sort of certifying that the CSP, uh, it's that for the CSP it's impossible to satisfy all M constraints simultaneously. It actually shows, certifies that it's impossible to satisfy even like something like 99.9% .9 of the constraints simultaneously. Um, more precisely, we'll say that uh, delta refutation is a proof that the optimal number of constraints you can satisfy simultaneously is at most 1 minus delta times m. And our algorithm provides such a refutation for some constant delta depending on p. So it's kind of bad. Maybe it's like 2 to the minus k, but it's some constant. Uh, independent of M and N. So that's a little bit nice. Uh, in fact, if you have any predicate at all, um, once you get number of constraints up to N to this complexity over 2, we provide you this uh, delta refutation. But if you're willing to have M be as big as N to the K over 2, the arity over 2, then actually we'll give you something even better. We'll give you what we'll call a strong refutation. And a strong refutation is a proof that not only can you not satisfy all the constraints, or 99% of the constraints, uh, it's that you can't even satisfy more than the uh, expected value of p times m constraints, plus little o of m, where the expected value of p means the probability that a random assignment satisfies p. So in other words, that it's certifying that um, no assignment to the variables can satisfy more than a little o of m uh, constraints beyond what you get from a uniformly random assignment. Okay, so in the case of 3SAT, a random assignment gives you 7 eighths of the constraint, and our uh, algorithm will actually certify that the optimum of a random 3SAT instance is at most 7 eighths m plus a little of m. Uh, for the KXOR constraint, or CSP, which we'll actually be talking about quite a bit uh, in the rest of the talk, here a random uh, assignment satisfies a KXOR constraint with probably a half, so our certifications are that the optimum is not much more than a half times m. And is that, um, can I ask, is yeah. that a particular feature of your algorithm? Or it's more of a generic probabilistic statement that you're making that you're saying, well, if I had a refutation algorithm that works in the <clears throat> regime, just the unsatisf 
unsatisfiability regime because of the fact that um, I don't know if you're not satisfiable, then you're going to be um, in that yeah. close to seven eight or something. Then then it would be the case. I mean, is is it really something of your algorithm, or it's a statement you could make more generally of any refutation? Uh, yeah, good question. No, it's definitely something particular to our algorithm. So if I, for example, only give you n to the complexity over two constraints, then in general we only know how to like slightly refute the instance. Uh, it's something particular about our algorithm that when you get up to n to the arity of for two, we can strongly refute it. I should also take this opportunity to mention, it's a good question, that um, these statements that the opt is not much more than the random assignment is, these statements are true with very high probability once the number of constraints gets bigger than like some constant times n. Um, so these, de these uh, strong refutations you know, uh, definitely exist with high probability of exponential size. Uh, in other words, these statements are true. Um, it's just that they're typically harder to certify than just unsatisfiability. Yeah. Uh, okay, any more questions about the statement? Okay. I think that's the last thing I have to say, yeah, about the statement. So now I will tell you what this complexity parameter is. Uh, so the complexity of a predicate P is the least integer T such that P does not support a t-wise uniform distribution. So, sorry that it's kind of like a, a negative definition, but that's the way I prefer to think of it. It's the least t such that p doesn't support a t-wise uniform distribution. Uh, let me give you some examples. Hopefully that will clear things up somewhat. So let's take a three set, the most basic example. So here the predicate p is the or of three things. So like I'll write here the, the seven uh, satisfying uh, inputs for or, all the triples of bits other than zero, zero, zero. Now let's try to figure out the complexity of this predicate. So the first thing you have to ask yourself is, okay, what about t equals two? Does this uh, set of seven strings support a two-wise uniform distribution, a pairwise uniform distribution? And the answer is yes. It's a fairly well-known thing. So I, in particular here, I highlighted four of the strings in yellow. And if you just take the uniform distribution on these four strings, quarter probability each, and you can see that all three columns are uniformly distributed, equal numbers of zeros and ones. And actually, all pairs of columns are also uniformly distributed. You see all the 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 with equal probability. Okay, so uniform distribution on those four things in the support is a pairwise uniform distribution. Uh, so that means the complexity is at least three. So then you can say, well, does it support a three-wise uniform distribution? And for this, the answer is no. Um, you know, the arity of the distribution is three. So the only way, I mean, so three-wise uniform distribution is just literally the uniform distribution. And you can't have the uniform distribution on all these strings because you're missing the all zero string. Okay, so that means that the complexity of this predicate is exactly three. And therefore, if you plug that into our algorithmic guarantee, it tells you that we can refute random three side instances once M is essentially bigger than n to the 3 over 2, 1.5. Um, you can see, by the way, now, where for every predicate on k uh, of arity k, except for the predicate that accepts everything, which we're going to always ignore because instances with that predicate are never unsatisfiable, uh, every predicate of arity k cannot support a k-wise uniform distribution because that would have to be the uniform distribution, and so it would have to include all strings, which it doesn't. So that's the proof that the complexity is always at most k. Uh, is that example clear? OK, I'm going to give another example to sort of illustrate a case where the complexity is less than the arity. So this is a case of two out of four sat, which is a slightly funny uh, CSP, but um, people who study CSPs love their sat variants, and this is like a known one. So here the predicate is all the uh, assignments to four variables that uh, have exactly two true. So here you've got a CSP where each constraint has four literals in it, and you're trying to make exactly two literals true inside each constraint. <clears throat> so let's figure out its complexity. Uh, the first thing to ask ourselves is, does it support a two-wise uniform distribution? And the answer to this is actually no. So okay, it, it takes like two minutes to prove this, so I won't quite prove it, although this parenthesis here at the bottom of the slide is kind of the proof. Um, briefly speaking, it's the symmetric predicate, so if it had if it supported some pairwise uniform distribution, you could symmetrize that distribution and get a symmetric pairwise uniform distribution. Um, but then that would just 
B, the uniform distribution on these six strings in the, in the predicate support, but that uniform distribution is not pairwise uniform. Uh, because if the first bit is 1, let's say, then it makes you more feel that the second bit is 0. OK, that wasn't a proper proof. And if you didn't catch it, never mind. But it's just to say that you can relatively easily check that this doesn't support a two-wise uniform distribution. And therefore, the complexity is 2. And that means that actually you can refute random 2 out of 4 sat instances as soon as the number of constraints is a bit bigger than n, which is n to the 2 over 2. In fact, uh, the exact same some things I just said holds literally um, for any predicate of the form j out of k sat. The complexity of any such predicate is 2. So that means, you know, even if it's, you know, 50 out of 100 sat, uh, the complexity is still 2, and you can still refute random instances of the 50 out of 100 sat problem, assuming the number of constraints is a bit bigger than n. Uh, actually, even this refutation factor has already appeared in um, some a uh, paper of Bilu and Ben Sasan, but uh, I think it's the easiest illustration of our, uh, of our result in a case where the arity can be arbitrarily bigger than the complexity. Questions about that case? OK. Um, so actually, let me just have, take one uh, slide at this time to mention uh, how this relates to uh, the idea of proving hardness of learning using hardness of refuting CSPs. So this paper from uh, Stock last year by Daniele uh, Liniel and Shalov Schwartz, where they made a very, very strong, like ambitious conjecture, um, which implies that for many kinds of k area predicates p, refuting random uh, CSPs with predicate p is quite hard. It can't be done in polynomial time, even when the number of constraints is like n to the something that goes to infinity with k. Um, so from this, they derived uh, quite a number of great hardness of learning results, like hardness of pack learning DNFs of constant size, intersections of thresholds, agnostically uh, learning thresholds, and so forth. Um, in particular, they derived these three hardness of learning results by instantiating their conjecture with three specific uh, predicate families. One was majority, one was something, uh, some predicate family that uh, Sangsha Huang used in some hardness results, and there's a third one. And that's how they got their three hardness of learning results. Uh, unfortunately, in our paper, we show that all of these predicates for arbitrary large k have complexity at most four. So actually, there is an algorithm, a polynomial time algorithm, that refutes random instances uh, as soon as the number of constraints is a little bit bigger than n squared. So unfortunately, it refutes the conjecture even in the specific cases where they used it to derive their specific hardness of learning results. Uh, however, all is not lost. It's a, actually it's still a great program for trying to prove hardness of learning results because in, in some subsequent papers, um, they actually mostly recovered their hardness of learning results, uh, slightly quantitatively worse, but basically recovered them based on um, much more plausible assumptions about the hardness of refuting random CSPs. Uh, so in fact, something like, you know, for k sat, they assume it's hard to refute random k sat instances when the number of constraints is like n to the square root k, which I personally find quite plausible because I only know how to do it when the number of constraints is like n to the k over 2. Um, okay, so they're a super optimistic conjecture we refute, but, you know, it's still quite possible to derive hardness of learning results in a plausible way from it. Okay. Uh, just then one more slide, I'm going to actually get to the algorithm and how it works. But let me just, I don't know if it's a good or bad idea to present this slide. It might be more confusing than helpful. But I, I do want to make one sort of warning or remark, um, which is that in this talk, we're talking exclusively about the problem where you have a completely random instance, and you're trying to prove it's unsatisfiable. Now, there's a related problem called that of finding satisfying assignments for planted random instances. In uh, that problem, you know, it's a sort of a not purely random instance. You sort of fix a secret satisfying assignment and choose a lot of random constraints uh, consistent with it. And then the algorithmic task is to find a satisfying assignment. So in that kind of problem, a condition extremely similar to this m should be at least n to the complexity over 2 also arises. This is in work by um, Feldman, uh, Vampala, and um, Perkins. Um, I just want to take this slide to warn you or assure you that 
Um, even though it, look, it uses all the same words and the same m to the m, at least n to the complexity over 2 comes up, these are quite different algorithms problems. So as far as I can tell, like you cannot use one to solve the other. In one case, you're trying to refute a completely random instance of a CSP. And in the other case, you're trying to find a satisfying assignment for a sort of semi-random planted CSP instance. Uh, any questions about that? OK. All right, so there's the theorem again. Uh, for a predicate p, we can refute it with high probability. Uh, on a random instance, provided the number of constraints is at least n to the complexity over 2. And for the remainder of my time, I'm going to try to sketch to you how this works. So the plan for the rest of the talk comes in three parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk to you about the specific case where the predicate is the XOR predicate, because that's a very important predicate for our, our results. And in fact, I'm going to show you how to prove our result in the special case where P is the XOR predicate. Um, and by the way, which has complexity k, so where the number of constraints m is at least n to the k over 2. But in particular, I'm going to show you how to strongly refute random kxor instances. In other words, show that every assignment satisfies not much more than half the constraints. Uh, I should mention on the subject of xor, uh, as you may know, as you may know um, if you have an xor instance which is unsatisfiable, it's actually very easy to prove that it's unsatisfiable. This is just like saying a system of equations uh, mod 2 is unsatisfiable, which you can easily um, give a proof for. In fact, you can certify it with Gaussian elimination. So when the, the constraint is kxor, you know, the fair task for an uh, unsatisfying regime is to delta refute it, or even better, strongly refute it. OK, so first part of the talk will be about kxor. Uh, in part two of the talk, I'll talk about this version of the result that provides a strong refutation for any k area CSP, provided the number of constraints is bigger than n to the k over 2. And in the last part of the talk, I'll prove the main theorem, uh, which gives a slight refutation, a delta refutation, but when the number of constraints is just a bit bigger than n to the complexity over 2, which can be much smaller than n to the k over 2. OK, so this is the plan for the rest of the talk. So I'll start with part one, which is about strong refutation for random instances of the KXOR problem. OK, so what are we trying to prove in this case? So we're given a random instance of the KXOR problem with m randomly chosen constraints. And we're assuming m is sort of a bit bigger by polylog factor than n to the k over 2. And we want to certify that every assignment satisfies not much more than half the constraints. Before I get to the algorithm, I should make some remarks about this particular problem. First of all, there's a paper by uh, Cooper, Koja, Oglund, and Fries from 2010, which actually strongly refutes any CSP, assuming the number of constraints m is a little bit bigger than n to the ceiling k over 2. So it's actually quite a lot like what I told you I told you I talk about in part uh, 2, except that we have n to the just k over 2, not ceiling k over 2. But I do want to say that like, if you don't really care about this distinction between n to the ceiling k over 2 and n to the k over 2, then, you know, for this part of the talk, and actually part two, you could just appeal to this earlier result. Um, nevertheless, I think we kind of give a slightly more conceptual way to reprove this result, so I'll still talk about how to do this task. Um, if you just want to get, hmm, apparently, Windows thought I was trying to, oh, goodness. OK, we're back. thought I was trying to search the web there. Uh, OK. Um, for this KXOR problem, if you just want to refute instances where m is a bit bigger than n to the ceiling k over 2, actually, there's a very easy way to do this in a black box way also um, using known results about approximation algorithms. Uh, also, in the particular case of 3SAT, um, strong refutation algorithm provided m is bigger than n to the 1.5 was achieved by this paper of um, Koja Oglon, Goethe, and Lanka from 2007. And I mention this because the KXOR algorithm I'm going to talk to you is sort of highly based on that. If you look at their paper, it's kind of messy, but if you like kind of stare at it for long enough, it's kind of clear that their algorithm also works for 3XOR. And then it's kind of somewhat clear that you can try to generalize it to higher K. So in fact, that's how our algorithm will work uh, by generalizing this Kojoglin Gerd Lanka paper. And I should also mention that. Uh, this generalization uh, to KXOR was done independently by Barak and Moitra uh, around the same time. Ryan? Yeah. 
just one small thing. So is it um, obvious where the threshold is? Where you know, if I forget about the refutation test, just finding where the threshold is that you cannot do better than random, is it known to be always below n to the k over two? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I uh, it's it's um, as soon as m gets bigger than like a fixed constant times n. Uh, it's not just unsatisfiable, but in fact, every assignment satisfies not much more than the random threshold. And this is easy to prove just by a turn-off bound. The constant is probably different than the constant just for unsatisfiability, but in any case, we're talking about a regime that's much bigger than that. So, okay, good. so the picture is the same as what we saw for 3SAT. And, and so for the case of k equals 2, it's a bit like showing that the graph is an expander. Is it somehow related? Yeah, so uh, in the case... Well, uh, in the case of k equals 2, yeah, exactly. I mean, um, yeah, it's similar to that. Or that if you have a, uh, it's also a special case of it is you have a graph where the largest cut cuts only a little bit more than half the edges. And you want to certify that it only cuts a little bit more than half the edges. And um, that's where this approximation algorithms literature comes in. Uh, that's actually known to be doable for any graph, not just a random one, but any graph where the max cut is only a little bit more than half the edges. Uh, an algorithm of Zwick um, finds such a cut. You know, it's, uh, well, anyway, the algorithm of Zwick can certify that the, the maximum cut is not much more than half the edges. Um, okay, so. Um, we're interested in the random KXOR case. If you only want to get n bigger than n to the ceiling k over 2, you can actually derive it from the k equals 2 case by a very trivial trick, just identifying um, blocks of k over 2 variables into single super variables. And to get the uh, n to the non-ceiling k over 2, you need a sort of noticeably clever trick, but it's still kind of a reduction to the k equals 2 case. Uh, all of which is to say, I want to um, tell you about the k equals 2 case. And that's all I'll be able to say for this, this problem. So in the random 2XOR case, I'll tell you a little bit of how the certification goes here. I want to show that when the number of constraints is a bit bigger than n, uh, you can efficiently certify that the optimum is not much more than half the constraints. Uh, so here there are n Boolean variables, x1 through xn, and m random constraints. So each one looks like xi or not xi, xor with uh, xj possibly negated. And first thing I'll do is my, my favorite trick in life, which is to switch from 0, 1 notation to plus or minus 1 notation. Uh, so doing that, it means that my n variables are now plus or minus 1 valued, and my m constraints look like plus or minus xi times xj equals 1. And instead of looking at the number of satisfied constraints, I'm also going to instead let opt denote the number of satisfied, the best number of unsatisfied minus unsatisfied constraints, sort of your advantage uh, in terms of satisfied minus unsatisfied constraints, which is also the same as the, given an assignment, the sum of the right-hand sides you achieve when the constraints are written in this way, plus or minus 1, xi, xj equals 1. Uh, so when you want to do this, to say that the opt is not much more than half is actually just to say that the new definition of opt, this difference, is little o of m. You know, half m minus half m is 0, so it's just the error term little o of m left. So that's what we're going to now try to show in this plus or minus 1 notation. In fact, we'll show something even a little bit better. We'll show that the absolute value of opt is a little of m, which is equivalent to saying not only does no assignment satisfy much more than half of the constraints, actually no assignment satisfies much fewer than half the constraints either. So we'll, in fact, even certify that stronger statement. OK, so this is our task for the 2XOR problem. Uh, oh, there's one more thing. in the, the the model I've been talking about so far, you choose exactly m constraints uniformly at random from all constraints. Uh, I'm just going to switch to like the GNP model instead. Um, it's basically the same thing, I assure you. So in this like GNP model, um, for each of the two times n choose two constraints, you include it with some probability p, where p is chosen so that the expected number of constraints is m. This is just helpful so that the absence or presence of each possible constraint is independent. So now p is like m over n squared. So if you plug this into what's written at the top of the slide, uh, it means you want to do this. So now it's like you know we're choosing each constraint with probability p, and we're assuming that p is a little bit bigger than 1 over n. This is what will give us a little bit bigger than n many constraints. 
we want to certify that the uh, opt is little of pn squared, which is like our m. OK, so now I'm going to encode the instance with a matrix. So let A be the random n by n symmetric matrix with entries minus 1, 0, and plus 1, uh, where in the ijth position we put 0 if there's no constraint, plus if there's a positive constraint, and minus if there's a minus constraint. And now it's, it's very easy to check that if x is a fixed assignment of plus or minus 1 values, the number of satisfied constraints minus the number of unsatisfied constraints is literally exactly x transpose ax, thinking of x as a column vector. Because what is x transpose ax? It's like sum over ij of aij, xi, xj. So the aijs are cooked up so that that's the case. And what we're going to use in this proof is just the basic fact about eigenvalues that x transpose ax is at most the length of x, which is square root n, times uh, the length of x, which is square root again, times the largest eigenvalue of a. So in other words, that this is at most n times the uh, largest eigenvalue of a. This is true for any vector x, Euclidean vector of length square root n. We only care about the ones that are plus or minus 1 uh, value, but in fact, we're going to show that it's true even for any such x. OK, so putting that all together, we have this random matrix A. It's pretty sparse, uh, random plus or minus 1 entries with sparsity like p. And <coughs> given any assignment x, we know that the opt is bounded by n times the largest eigenvalue of A. And so this is sort of the key point. We're done if we can mathematically show that the largest eigenvalue of A is little o of p times n with high probability. Because then with this extra factor of n, uh, you get that opt is at most little of pn squared. And the reason we're done, uh, if we can just show that mathematically holds with high probability, is because an algorithm can efficiently certify this bound on the eigenvalue whenever it's true. So the algorithm doesn't have to like prove that the eigenvalue uh, is little of pn with high probability. It just has to like compute the largest eigenvalue and check that it's little of pn. And we just on the side have to prove that uh, this is a good way to bound the opt uh, with high probability. Uh, so then this is just like a you know good old fashioned olden days fact about like the largest eigenvalue in a random matrix. You can look up the answer in textbooks. Uh, you can use the trace method, uh, Fouradi and Komloch, maybe that's the easiest way to do it. You find that indeed, the, for this case, the largest eigenvalue is big O of root Pn with high probability. And indeed, root Pn is like a lot smaller than uh, Pn, precisely when Pn is like a number bigger than 1, which is the, the assumption we have, that P is a lot bigger than 1 over n. OK, so that's sort of the end of the 2XOR story. Any questions about that? OK, so that's all I'll tell you about KXOR. Um, seem to take up a lot of time, but uh, even though right. we have two parts left, we're almost done. Yeah? Um, feel free to ignore this. I'm not sure if it makes sense. But there was this paper of um, uh, Subash and the stuff about like 3XOR maximizing you know, three X or doesn't make. Is it yeah, connected? I remember it. Okay, is it? Uh, let's see. Uh, is the given approximation for this norm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that paper is showing that. I think of a square root of an approximation for this norm for three times, yeah. which it might allow you to recover the um into the um, three halves. Yes, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I have to think about it because they have a pretty large approximation factor, but maybe that's okay because the true optimum for a random instance is very close to a half. Right. Uh, I think I'm you not, don't lose much by this. Yeah. Okay, I'd have to look into that. It's a good question. I'm not sure. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, OK, so that's the story on strong refutation for KXOR, which is part one of the algorithm. So part two and of the just, algorithm. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yes, sorry, so sorry, for K, you end up uh, just having K tensors instead of, uh, of matrices, or you also go down to matrices uh, eventually? It's somehow a reduction again to matrices. So you very carefully set up um, 
matrices that are about n to the k by n to the k and show that their uh, largest eigenvalue is small. Uh, so these matrices that you carefully set up are not totally random matrices, you know, with like independent entries, but they're kind of somewhat random, and it's like random enough that you can still use the trace method to bound them. And, you know, this careful setup of the matrix from the instance is also enough to show that the instance's value is small if the eigenvalue of this matrix is small. Maybe I said that too fast. But, uh, that's the story there. Uh, so I have one more question. Uh, mm -hmm. So for k equals 2, you're getting an optimal refutation, right, for like at roughly the satisfiability threshold? Yeah, up to the polylog factors. Up to the polylog factors. So uh, oh, like suppose we could have uh, put algorithmically computed upper bounds on uh, eigenvalues of three tensors or five tensors mm -hmm. instead of reducing it to a matrix and losing something there would it have resulted in better refutation for KXON? Um, let's see. To be completely honest, I don't exactly know what an eigenvalue of a K tensor is, although it yeah, may well I'm exist. Sure that would make I, sense, but uh, um, yeah, you, well, um, yeah, you have to be careful about what's true. So one convenient thing in the K equals 2 case is that, you know, once you set it up you know, with this plus or minus 1 notation, uh, it's true that not only does every plus or minus 1 assignment not do very well, every, you know, Euclidean vector assignment of length square root n also doesn't do well. Um, so you have to make sure that whatever the analogous statement for higher tensors is, is also true, and then you have to worry about whether you can compute these eigenvalues or upper bounds. So I don't actually know about either of those states of affairs. No, there are, um, I don't know what the exact bounds are, but there's definitely bounds on the largest eigenvalue of K tensors for, for general K, or, or at least a constant K, you can, I mean, um, this, this exists. You can for random. And you, it's, you, you can define it, uh, yeah, N by N by N, instead of being N by N, and then you, you know, it just has three faces. Um, so you, there are like bounds on this, like um, for random tensors, like random each entry is. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. yeah. And can you like um, compute this upper bound uh, or compute the eigenvalues of these tensors efficiently? I think, no, I think the best thing that's no. known. Go ahead, go ahead. I think the best thing that's known for like computing these injective tensor norms of tensors is just to flatten them out as matrices mm -hmm. and then put the up or singular value of the matrix the singular value of those matrices is clearly an upper bound on the tensor norms and okay. that's pretty much what's algorithmically known so how you to do that efficiently the question is is that a good upper bound on the eigenvalue you will lose n to the k over 2 factor if you that's ceiling of k over 2 right uh, Possibly. Yeah, ceiling, yeah, because, yeah, yeah I think it was ceiling, yeah, ceiling, that's it. Yeah. Ceiling, uh, Yeah, I can mention the case where k is even is somehow much easier. There's, like, a variety of easy ways. So part two, strong refutation for any KCSP. Okay, so now let's imagine that, uh, you know, we have some KCSP, and this picture here, K is uh, 5, and I called the predicate P. And so the input to this just looks like a list of M constraints, each of which is P applied to five literals, variables of indications. Okay, so this is M, this is K. And I'm going to make a definition now. So let's imagine you're given a specific assignment X to all the bits. Now, you can imagine plugging that assignment into the constraints, and that'll give you, you know, ones and zeros here. And I'm, I like to think of this as a table with m rows and k columns of zeros and ones. And I'll say that given x, the table probability distribution, d sub x, it's probability distribution on k bit strings, and it's just the uniform distribution over the rows of this table. So you're just having fixed x, you pick a random row and output the k bit um, string that's sort of going into the the predicate there. 
And please notice that this has absolutely nothing to do with the predicate p. I mean, p is there in the input, but this table distribution really only depends on the k tuples or five tuples of variables and the negation patterns. OK, so uh, that's the definition of the table distribution. And now I want to make another definition. I'll say that a particular CSP instance i is quasi-random if for every assignment x, the table distribution is pretty much the uniform distribution on 0, 1 to the k. Okay, so it should be a little o of 1 close, where this little o of 1 is with reference to n and n going to infinity. Okay, and again, this has nothing to do at all with the, um, the predicate. It's just the property of the, the k tuples in the instance and their negation patterns. And one thing I'd like you to observe, this is a simple fact, is that if you have a, a CSP instance i, which is quasi-random, then it means the optimum value is not much more than uh, what you get from a random assignment. Because indeed, it, it says that for every assignment x, um, when you look at what sort of gets plugged into the m constraints, you're pretty much plugging in the uniform distribution. So the overall fraction of constraints you'll satisfy is pretty much, this is all up to little o of 1, uh, what would be satisfied by a random assignment. OK, so um, what our strategy will be in our algorithm will be to actually uh, certify that, uh, given the instance, that it's quasi-random instance. Because if we can certify that, then it just follows immediately that the optimum is essentially not much more than that given by a random assignment. OK, and this, again, is ultimately going to have nothing to do with the predicate anymore. We're just certifying something about how random-looking the instances are, the k-tuples and the negation patterns. Uh, any question about that? Uh, Ryan, I'm a little unclear about this. So you're saying yeah. you will certify that the instance is quasi-random, which is just this distribution and patterns. And for, from there, it will mathematically, it of course, follows that if you apply the predicate P, nothing much will change. Is it something algorithmically also something that's uh, expressible? Does um, that make any sense? No, so in some sense, we don't have to do that. So if you remember, I mean, uh, what does a refutation algorithm have to do? It has to output either, let's say, strongly unsatisfiable or I don't know. And it has to always be correct. So if it outputs strongly unsatisfiable, that has to be true um, for certain. And it's also, you know, most of the time has to output strongly unsatisfiable. And so it's enough for this algorithm to output strongly unsatisfiable whenever it sort of provably convinced itself that it's quasi-random. OK, got it. Yeah, yeah makes sense. Yeah, good question. Yeah. Um, of course, another thing to bear in mind is, I mean, this is a reasonable strategy, but in order for this strategy to have a hope of working, it should be like mathematically true that a random instance is quasi-random with high probability. Uh, but that is indeed the case, as we'll essentially show. OK, so this is the plan now. Given a random uh, k area CSP and with the number of constraints being a bit bigger than n to the k over 2, we want to certify that it's quasi-random. Again, that has nothing to do with the predicate. So uh, we're given the k tuples and the negation patterns. And for each table distribution d sub x, for every assignment x, we are trying to certify that it's close to the uniform distribution. Well, there's something uh, very basic from analysis of Boolean functions, sometimes called the Vazirani XOR level, which says that uh, any old probability distribution on k-bit strings is close to uniform distribution if and only if it has um, almost no correlation with any XOR of a subset of the coordinates. Actually, the Vazirani XOR lemma is usually says that you're exactly uniform if you have zero correlation with all the uh, 2 to the n, 2 to the k minus 1 different XORs of subsets. But it's also, there's a closeness version as well. Um, so this changes our task if we want to use this Fazerani XOR lemma uh, from uh, certifying that for every x, d sub x is close to uniform, to certifying that for every x, all subsets of columns look like they have no correlation with the XOR of those column bits. And this is exactly the thing that we certified in part one, that um, you know, for every subset of columns, you could just imagine that this were an instance of the XOR CSP just on those columns. And the exact thing that we showed in part one is that um, uh, with high probability, we can certify that for every X, there's a no correlation 
between, you know, the any assignment X, uh, you know, uh, satisfies the given XOR of columns with probability half plus or minus little low of one. Okay, so we just need to run that certification algorithm from part one for all two to the k minus one uh, non-empty subsets of the coordinates. And we certified that for every dx, it uh, has little of one correlation with the x or of the s coordinates, and therefore every d of x is essentially the uniform distribution. Any questions about that? Okay, great. So that's the end of part two. Um, I should mention there that we needed a number of constraints that was like n to the k over 2 because, the, you know, the largest XOR is all k columns and we needed n to the k over 2 uh, constraints in order to strongly refute uh, k XOR instances. Okay, so the final part 3 is about the main theorem, which is about refuting a random uh, instance of CSP with predicate p just provided that the number of constraints is potentially much smaller, just a little bit bigger than n to the complexity over 2. So to remind you one more time, the complexity of a predicate p is the least t, such that p doesn't support a t-wise uniform distribution. Um, OK, so let's say we have some such p, and it doesn't support a t-wise uniform distribution. OK, another way to say that in the contrapositive is that every t-wise uniform distribution is not completely supported on p. In fact, though, you can say, this is a bit of a technical point, but you can say something a little bit stronger than that. Um, you can actually deduce that every t-wise uniform distribution uh, is not just not supported on p, but it has to put a little constant amount of probability mass off of p. So it has to, in fact, be delta far from being supported on p where delta is some constant that only depends on p, or maybe on k, like, I don't know, 2 to the minus k or something. And uh, it's a small technical point. It's basically because the property of uh, supporting a t-wise uniform distribution can be expressed as a linear program. Uh, and therefore, you know, um, whenever you have a non-zero solution to a linear program, like, uh, it has a value that has bit complexity depending only on k, and so therefore it's at least uh, some constant depending only on k. OK, so uh, if we have such a P that has complexity T, it doesn't support a t-wise uniform distribution. We know that every t-wise uniform distribution is a bit far from being supported on P. And uh, now what are we going to do, since we don't have as many as n to the k over 2 constraints, we can't um, certify that all subsets of columns are not uh, correlated with XOR. What we'll do is just certify that um, all column, uh, sets of columns, uh, sets of at most t columns are not uh, correlated with XOR. Okay, so we're going to strongly refute the SXOR constraint for all subsets of the columns of cardinality at most t. So just that all the, in a sense, we're showing that all subsets of at most t columns look uniform. And this we can do uh, by the XOR algorithm, provided that m is a little bit bigger than n to the t over 2, which is the number of constraints we're shooting for. And what this does is it certifies that all these table distributions, d sub x, maybe they're not um, close to being fully uniform, but they're close to being t-wise uniform. Uh, that's little o of 1 close. And therefore, you know, they are far from being supported on p. They have to be at least delta minus this little o of 1 far from being supported on p. Okay, so what this does is certifies for every assignment x, um, when you look at the table distribution, uh, has to have at least essentially delta probability, delta fraction of rows, uh, not in the support of P. In other words, the delta fraction of the constraints are not satisfied. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Uh, okay, so in other words, that certifies that the op is at most 1 minus delta times uh, M, which is what we were shooting for. Okay, that's it. So that's the end of part 3. And I just have one more slide about open directions. So I think the main uh, direction of interest is to try to give evidence that this number of constraints, n to the complexity of p over 2, is optimal. That maybe if you have fewer than n to the complexity over 2 constraints, um, even though it's true that a random CSP is not satisfiable, um, it's hard for a polynomial time algorithm to certify this fact. Uh, in other words, what we want to show, or Tanis thinks I'm talking to it again, what we want to show is that if uh, 
P supports a T minus one uniform distribution, um, then we want to show that various efficient refutation algorithms uh, will fail if there are uh, noticeably fewer than n to the t over two constraints. Uh, excuse me for a second here. Right. Uh, so the first uh, result along these lines uh, was from this work by Van Sasson and Wiederson from 99, uh, concerned with the KXO or in KSAT um, constraint satisfaction problems. And indeed, they show that the resolution proof system will not refute uh, random instances of this unless the number of constraints is at least n to the k over 2. So that's an illustration of that uh, being sharp for resolution. Um, now, there's a much stronger kind of uh, proof system that's uh, very much in the news these days, this SOS, uh, sum of squares proof system. And shown back in 2008 showed that even this very strong algorithmic uh, proof system, SOS, fails for KXOR and KSAT unless the number of constraints is basically about n to the k over 2. So that's pretty reasonable evidence uh, in the case of XOR and uh, SAT. Um, now, for general... Uh, constraints P, uh, we don't know quite as much. So there's a, a number of works in this area that have considered uh, this question for the weaker proof system called Shirali Adams Plus. It's some kind of STP-based proof system that's uh, weaker than SOS. Uh, but then indeed they show that if M is <coughs> noticeably less than N to the complexity over 2, then this Shirali Adams Plus system fails. Um, another line of work uh, due to Feldman and all showed that certain statistical algorithms fail unless the number of constraints is like uh, m is like n to the complexity over 2. And finally, in the particular case of t equals 3, uh, complexity being 3, so this is the case where um, p supports a pairwise uniform distribution. Uh, Barak, uh, Chan, and Kothari recently showed that SOS fails uh, when m is uh, order n. Uh, actually, they don't quite do it for random instances. They do it for sort of pruned random instances, but that's close to random instances. And so uh, what I think is a very good concrete open question for this area is, in this particular case, try to show that SOS fails even for m uh, a bit less than n to the 1.5, which is what you'd be shooting for for predicates that support a pairwise uniform distribution. OK, any questions about these open directions? OK, that's all I have to say. So uh, are there are any overall questions? Thanks, Brian. OK. Thanks, Vinantia. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Uh, the reason Barak Chan Kothari doesn't get into the three halves is because of this girth condition that they need, and that fails with larger densities? Uh, yeah, I think that's a major uh, issue with it. Um, in particular, they can't even work with purely random instances. They have to do a little pruning. I think that's to get rid of some growth yeah, conditions. Yeah, different small cycles by deleting few edges. Uh, yeah, you would exactly know. Um, yeah, so I think that's a, that's a main problem there. I see. So Ryan, last time there were some there were some questions about how you managed to deal with the odd number of uh, variables. Do you want to talk about this, like cakes or? Um, it's a bit hard to explain in a short amount of time. I mean, it's, you know, somehow if you're given, let's say, a 3XOR constraint, you know, by um, sort of bucketing the constraints based on what the third variable is, you can uh, turn it into a bunch of 2XOR constraints, you know, use cauchy schwarz it converts it to a 4XOR instance, and then you use the even techniques, uh, even K techniques there. But um, in short, it's not really easy to say how to do it in a, a short amount of time, except that it's sort of a very clever reduction to the even K case, so the K equals 2 Ks. Uh, are there any more questions? Looks like there's no more questions, so we can probably go for here or something. OK, so everyone can stay for more questions. I'll just uh, close the broadcast. OK. okay thanks.